I think, do you need a degree to get into the industry? Absolutely not. Um, it's not a requirement at all. Uh, it doesn't really mean anything, to be honest. Um, you know, we, we've just hired three people in our team. Uh, one of them has a bachelor's degree, one of them has done an online course, and one of them has had, you know, two years in accounting. And that's, you know, completely different walks of life, and they've all come in at the same role. I would say that it really comes down to the person um, and their attitude. Thanks for coming on to have a chat. Uh, we are talking cybersecurity today, specifically around uh, career development, uh, breaking into the industry and all that kind of stuff. I know a lot of people who watch this channel, uh, they want to get their foot in the door, right? They want to land their first job and progress their career and so forth. Uh, now you just have a wealth of knowledge around these topics. Um, actually, you've actually had a hand in getting me into pen testing as well. <laughs> I connected with you last year on LinkedIn and uh, you gave me some advice on how to get in the industry. So uh, who better to discuss this with than uh, Jacob Larson, <laughs> welcome on the show, man. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, looking forward to having a chat. Yeah, so why don't we start off uh, with a bit of background, like uh, what you do and uh, how did you get into cybersecurity? Sure. So I work in governance, risk, and compliance. Um, I've been working for there for about four years now, um, and I work with Andy at the same company uh, doing consulting. Um, obviously, Andy, you're doing pen testing, and I'm, I'm doing GRC. How do I get into the GRC? To be honest, I kind of just fell into it by chance. I went to university and I studied counterterrorism, security and intelligence. And I wanted to uh, actually do counter fraud as I wanted to understand how to yeah, prevent like credit card fraud and that sort of stuff. But as I got through my you know, degree in my study, I saw that I had an opportunity to do a major in cybersecurity. And I found that really fascinating. And um, you know, I'd always been interested in IT from a young age, did IT at high school, um, got involved in a little bit of startup and things like that in high school as well. Um, and I thought, you know what, I'll do cybersecurity as my major. Um, but I honestly hated software engineering. I, I didn't, couldn't, couldn't stand programming. You know, in hindsight, that was a mistake, like, because now I, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not required for GRC, but it's really good to have an understanding about, you know, code and how it works. Um, but yeah, so I had the option to do cybersecurity at university. I picked it and I just absolutely loved it. Um, I really liked understanding how you know, an attacker can compromise an organization, uh, you know, how they can pivot through a network and, you know, you know, exfiltrate information. Now, back then, the real thing that we were looking at was, uh, you know, threat actors were really just compromising databases to sell, but that's now no longer really like the, the model. The model is more about ransomware and things like that. But yeah, that's, that's what I did. I uh, finished that um, and the end of my course, I had the option to do an internship um, and from there, after a three-month internship, got offered a full-time position um, and stayed in the team. When I, when I actually had my first interview, they said, what do you want to do? And I said, digital forensics. <laughs> but at the time, there wasn't really any uh, pipeline of work for digital forensics. But to be honest, I wanted a foot in the door. I wanted to take any role I could. And so I jumped into governance, risk, and compliance, um, which is what I would say is the more businessy side of cybersecurity. Um, so GRC actually stand, yeah, stands for Governance, Risk and Compliance. Governance being you know, how a business can operate and integrate a cybersecurity function into their business um, in a consistent and repeatable way. Risk being uh, risk management, so assessing what is the risk to a business of a cybersecurity event occurring and how can they uh, mitigate that and impl implement controls. Um, and compliance is you know, depending on the sector they operate in, there may be certain requirements they have to adhere to um, to ensure that they're you know, appropriately protecting either their customers' information uh, or you know, for the government's, you know, the government's citizens' information or potentially the availability of infrastructure like critical infrastructure and things like that. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so you mentioned you started with an internship. How hard was it actually to find that internship and what was the process? Because a lot of people, they, you know, they go to university, they graduate, and then, you know, they can't find any opportunities. Uh, so what was your process like uh, for that? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the, the, very fortunately at the university I went to, they had a, like a, a team that were responsible for coordinating internships with industry. However, I didn't actually get my placement at the company through that unit. I actually approached them and said, hey, I've got one. Can you coordinate it for me? And the way that I got mine was honestly by chance. I was at a charity a dinner um, that I bought a ticket to, 
just speaking to random people in business and said, you know, I'm working, studying cybersecurity and counterterrorism, you know, and they're like, oh, I know someone that has just started a consulting company in that, and that was uh, yeah, Spence from, from Diamond Cyber. And so they gave me their email, their contact. I reached out and said, can I come in just to ask you a few questions? I didn't necessarily say, can I have a job or can I have an internship? I said, can I have a conversation? And I think that's uh, what, you know, will be good for people as a recommendation. So networking is one thing, but when you do networking, you don't just approach someone and say, can I have a job? Yeah, it's about building a relationship, um, you know, asking questions, you know, showing that you are genuinely interested and passionate and you want to learn and, and know more. Um, and then from there, from that building that relationship, you will develop opportunities to have an internship or have an interview for a role. And that's how it worked for me. I had a conversation, came back again for another conversation a couple of months later, and then was able to secure an internship and then contacted my university and they kind of lined it up from the paperwork side. Yeah. Yeah, nice, nice. So you actually sort of landed that role from a live event where you were yeah. you had the opportunity to meet people in the industry and that was through um, just the university uh, events yeah so it wasn't actually a university event it was just like a random uh, charity night my, my dad was actually involved in the charity night um, I know it's probably not it's a very niche circumstance that probably not most people would get, get into when it comes to finding a role so for me that was just real luck to be honest meeting the right person at the right time um, and just casually conversation but in terms of recommendations for people that are trying to break into the industry, I would say that networking is, you know, 50% of it. You know, having the skill and the talent is, is one thing. Uh, but at, the, at this, you know, these days, the universities and the courses online and things like that are spitting out a lot of graduates. And the amount of entry-level roles that are available is quite minimal. So getting a first job is really difficult, um, particularly if you're, you know, in a different industry and you're trying to pivot as well. And so... It's not enough just to have the, the paperwork, which is the tick in the box for, you know, I've got a degree or I've got this cert and things like that. Um, you really do need to go and have conversations with people. Um, so, you know, in Australia, there's heaps of events, you know, conferences, um, there's networking nights. Like we have one second Thursday of the month in Perth where you can you know, go and have a beer and, and have a conversation with people. Um, but obviously, speaking to people in person is uh, one thing, but also going online. You know, having creating a LinkedIn profile, uh, filling in some information on there, and just reaching out to people randomly and asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I think a lot of people who end up in cyber, it's sort of like that randomness factor in it as well, just randomly meeting the the right person. Um, but then you also have to sort of put yourself in that position as well, right? You have to like go out there and look for these um, networking opportunities, uh, which I don't think like a lot of people who go to university do that much no yeah i mean to be honest and i mean the young i mean people that go to university are typically like young demographic uh, like myself and i went and you know i didn't go to half my classes when i was at university you know you're too busy either yeah. working part-time or you know drinking beer and things like that you know so people will often sign up to things but not actually show up particularly for students but to be honest the ones that get their roles secured for is when they graduate when they've already been searching for a role six months before they finish you know um, I think networking is really important um, as you know you can only gleam so much from a resume when it gets admitted to you you know from my perspective you know now that I'm in a position where I'm interviewing people uh, you know you can only get so much from a resume but if you see a name and it's familiar or you know someone that you've one of your peers has spoken to that person uh, that that can be all it takes to just kind of just go straight to the interview you know what I mean yeah yeah so if you know the person then you'll at least like get them to come in and have a chat and sort of opportunities will open up uh, from there. Yeah, well, you know, if you've already had a conversation with someone at like a networking event or, you know, a conference or something like that, you probably already have a good understanding of, well, one, what part of security are they interested in? You know, is it digital forensics, penetration testing, GRC, you know, being a SOC analyst, things like that. Um, and two, you know, how they articulate and communicate themselves. I mean, t particularly for GRC, it's not just we're looking at what is your technical capability for entry-level roles. It really is what is your attitude, what's your approach to learning. Um, you know, those sort of characteristics are really important. And so having a conversation with someone at an event, you can quite quickly tell, you know, why this person is in security or what motivates them, uh, you know, what are they passionate about, you know. 
quite often people will say, oh, I want to get into cybersecurity. It's the next be- biggest thing. But it's like, what does that actually mean? You know what I mean? Are you just trying to get on the bandwagon because you think you're going to get a good salary? Or are you, you know, really curious about how attackers work and, you know, how an organization is structured? You know, are you passionate about, you know, giving back to your community, things like that? Those are more meaningful causes uh, and attitudes that we would look for when interviewing a candidate. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so I think a lot of those things you mentioned are actually like soft skills. Like you have to be able to talk to people and actually make like a more personal connection perhaps. Um, Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And how do people go about developing these soft skills? Just like, because I think that's a lot of, that's an area where university students might lack. And how would you recommend someone developing these uh, sort of soft skills? I'll give you a story like it's it's honestly the answer is exposure therapy for me in high school um you know you know over five years ago or five geez more than that 10 years ago um I was a type of kid that if I had to do a presentation in front of the class I would get the, like the leg wobbles you know like the actual shakes you know I couldn't I couldn't speak in front of anyone not even 10 people um it scared me shitless you know uh, oh sorry I don't know if we can swear no that's alright right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay but um yeah, and so for me, it was just exposure therapy. So um, whether it's getting involved in a community event, um, you know, getting involved in university, presenting when you, you know, for example, at a group assignment for university, uh, and, you know, someone might have to put their hand up to be the one that does the presentation. You know, putting yourself in those situations, throwing yourself in the deep end. You know, you've got to be willing to make yourself vulnerable because it's a lot of anxiety, you know, doing that sort of stuff. You're just going to put yourself out there. You've got to throw yourself in the deep end. And after time, you'll get really good at it. You know, and you'll mm-hmm. overcome it, and it'll just be it'll be normal. Um, but yeah, in, in summary, I think you know, getting involved in community events, um, you know, at university, volunteering, they're not volunteering, um, you know, presenting for the group and things like that. Um, if you can get involved in like uh, any kind of groups online, like Discord groups, commu- you know, computer science groups, all that sort of stuff, um, anything like that can be good for you. Yeah. Mm. I think online maybe it's a bit harder to develop the soft skills because you're typing behind a keyboard. So you really need that live exposure. I think like speaking, speaking at conferences, and then like just talking to people and getting just more sociable. I think. Yeah, I think there's a spectrum of people where they're at with that. And if you're the type of person where you know, you know, you are at home just studying, grinding security, you know, being the best pen in the world, uh, and you don't go out at all. I mean, for you, like a recommendation would just be go down to the beach or if you're on the beach, go down to your local city and just ask random people what time it is. Like, get used to speaking to strangers, uh, really small things. Um, and then, you know, that uh, anxiety of approaching someone or, you know, putting yourself out there, you know, you're kind of building yourself up to it. You know what I mean? You could literally just ask someone, you know, where, you know, wh- where's the library or, you know, what time is it, things like that. Kind of any kind of exposure therapy of putting yourself out there, kind of build that immunity for that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a really good tip. Um, I'll share a funny story. Like, yeah. for me, I think developing those soft skills, I actually developed them through, like, cold approaching women on the street. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a... <laughs> I did that in my 20s. And, you know, like, before I did that, yeah, I was... Like, my communication skills were, like, absolutely shit. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just, like, having that, like, more... Because you're kind of throwing yourself in the deep end and then just mm. practicing how to have, like, a meaningful conversation with people... Um, I think that's actually what helped me the most. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. No, I can definitely see why that would that would help. I think the biggest thing is like, you know, making yourself vulnerable can be really scary, um, and it's the rejection that people are, are worried about, right? Uh, whether that's with women or even security, like approaching a security professional, you have got no experience, you really want to get a role, and you're really worried they're going to say, "Sorry, mate, I, I can't help you." You know, all that rejection, you know. So it's overcoming that fear just by exposure therapy can be really good. Yeah. 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 Nice, nice. Um, so you've been working as a security consultant, uh, GRC, for quite some time now, and uh, you've recently uh, stepped up to a management position, uh, which is super yeah. cool and <laughs> um, well-deserved. Congrats on that. Thank you. Uh, so what does your day-to-day look like uh, now, like maybe you, like before you uh, stepped up to management and now uh, as a manager? Yeah, so for me personally, it hasn't changed all that much i think it's more a sense of a a change in the way that you operate in a way um you know 
before being a manager, I was still very much involved in you know leadership um, and mentorship, um, you know, giving people advice and things like that. You know, the, the manager in the in my role is more from the sense of managing complex projects with lots of stakeholders and and other consultants in the team. So you might be the lead on a on a large complex engagement for a customer, uh, where you have a team of say you know two to three to four or five people you know on the projects. I think. Um, there's a few things. I mean, from a consulting perspective, you've got more responsibility and accountability when it comes to managing the finances around, you know, how much time are people spending on things, uh, what's the project tracking like from a project management perspective, and things like that. Um, but in terms of the day-to-day -day operations, about you know, you know, retaining staff, um, mentoring staff, giving people a development journey so they can grow, um, what, building a culture where people are you know, want to come to work and are excited about what they do. There's definitely been a, a few learnings uh, in that regard. The biggest learning for me uh, when it comes to uh, being a manager is about providing people uh, feedback. Um, you know, it's really important that you give people clear, concise, and actionable feedback. You don't want someone that comes to you for a question leaving more confused than they came in. It, you know, if you're saying in order to get promoted, you have to do this, you know, it should be very clear. You know, in order to overcome this obstacle in this project, uh, this is what you should do. You know, it should be very clear what your feedback should be. But also, not in terms of um, just improving, but making sure that, you know, when you need to give people hard feedback, that it is, can come off, you know, as a little bit blunt. Um, you know, for example, if someone's underperforming, it's really important that you don't to say, oh, you're doing great work, no worries, I'll, I'll take over for it and I'll fix all the changes. It's like, you know, I know that it'll take me less time if I fix it, but really that's a development opportunity for that person and I need to make sure that I'm investing time and giving them appropriate feedback uh, and, and really constructive criticism so that they can change. Um, because, you know, if you go through a year of without actually giving someone the opportunity to improve or giving them the right feedback, when they're underperforming and you want to let them go, they'll say, well, why didn't you just help me, you know? And if you don't help them the first time, they might think that what they're currently doing is the right way, and then you'll just deal with the same problem over and over again. So the biggest learning for me was making sure to give people, you know, constructive criticism, but not glossing over when someone's underperforming. Yeah. So, like, how did you learn these concepts as a manager because you st you're still very young and <laughs> <laughs> you've uh you know progressed your pr career in this industry i think extremely quickly um, so that's a lot of soft skills and leadership skills um, how did you manage to like develop those sort of areas and i think is grc a particularly good option if you want to go that route uh, because it's a lot more like business side right yeah so you have more opportunity to talk to people and that kind of stuff yeah, well, I've, I think I've, I'm definitely a people person. Like, for me, my role, I love being around people. Um, and that's how I knew that GRC was the right option for me. Um, in terms of, you know, what people want to do, I think if you're definitely more interested in working with people, having conversations, building relationships, presenting, um, you know, solving complex problems, you know, in GRC, there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Um, that that'll be a good option for people but sorry what, what was the other question that you asked more so around you know what are around like developing your leadership skills yeah uh, yeah honestly i read a lot of books uh listened to a lot of podcasts um there's a book called radical candor and it talks about like what i talked about before giving people the right feedback and things like that i feel like there's not really but like you can't just read a book and then apply it you know a lot of it's just learning on the job you know, um, observing others, having a good mentor. Uh, I think that's something that everyone should have uh, is having a good mentor, someone that you can uh, can ask advice and not, not you don't have to be afraid of being looking like an idiot in front of them, asking them questions without fear of judgment, things like that. So having a good mentor in my life was really important. Um, and then I found that when I had the opportunity to maybe help others to pay that forward um, and give other people help. And so in a way for me, uh, I, you know, I posted on LinkedIn maybe like two years ago. If anyone wants to have a coffee that's trying to get into cybersecurity, send me a message. And I had probably, you know, over four weeks, like 50 people message me. And I caught up with probably half of them in person. And the other half had, you know, phone calls over Teams. 
And even that was good for me, you know, sitting down, meeting a stranger, learning about their journey, uh, you know, giving them my advice uh, and things like that. And I learned over time of having those conversations about, you know, what is the thing that people really need to hear uh, and what are like actionable steps and things like that. Um, so I think it's just kind of natural development over time, really. Uh, I don't think there's any kind of specific feedback or, or recommendation in a way. I think it's something that you're going to have to learn on the job. You can't just go and study a, you know, a management degree and then become a manager. That's not how it works. Um, you know, you need to get experience on the job. Um, but I think, you know, really listening to people and being genuine, uh, building a, a team that, like, wants to spend time with each other outside of work and things like that is really important. Like, uh, a team with uh, a lot of trust, you know, that, that, yeah, they're excited to work together, things like that. And over time, you know, the opportunity to progress will just appear. Yeah, I've noticed you've done a lot of that stuff on LinkedIn, yeah. like for, for a long time, actually. Yeah, just being very active on LinkedIn, um, talking to people. Um, I didn't know you actually like went out um, and met people uh, yeah. in person um, as well. So that's really cool. Like you've, you've mentored a lot of people um, to uh, bring them into this industry. Um, so you mentioned like technical uh, versus a GRC role. Uh, would you say that it's like, so you you should choose which side you want to go, right? If you're a technical person, you go the technical route. And then if you're more of a people's person, you go the... Yeah, I, I think it depends. Like, I would say that, you know, if you're the beginning of your career and you haven't actually had a security role, role yet, don't be like, I have to do this specific one thing and that's it, you know? Be willing to try anything. But at the same time, I definitely feel that there's a different temperament of people or maybe personality types that gravitate to, to those different areas. Um, you know, because some people don't want to be writing reports or doing presentations or speaking in front of people or going out to like three different companies throughout the day. They want a consistent schedule. They want to be able to work from home every single day and they want to be able to do remote work all the time and, and things like that. Um, so I think it really depends on your personality and temperament. Um, I think there's like, there are definitely pros and cons to both GRC and pen testing. Um, let me, I wrote some of them down. Let me just have a quick look, two secs. I think um, for GRC, it's definitely easier to get into than, say, pen testing, for example, or technical. Mm, that's interesting. Um, I would say that your ability to be upskilled into a role straight away is a lot faster. There's more roles. I mean, in Australia, for example, on Seek, I've looked at the data. There's more roles for GRC than there are for pen testing uh, for entry-level jobs. And that's because it is more oriented to being as a part of a business. Uh, the communication skills, the you know, the routine, the, the way that you operate in that role, it's a lot easier to kind of fit that person into, into any organization because um, it's more business-like. Um, I think that people that, if you want to work with people more than computers, then GRC might be a better option for you. Um, but I guess some of the, the cons of GRC is that, you know, report writing can be boring, you know, even though I've done it for quite a while. Um, I do enjoy it, but I mean, you know, sometimes a report is boring and that's just a reality depending on the customer and the complexity of the environment and things like that i would say that grc is also further away from the threat or the action um you know because you're kind of more dealing with uh some of sometimes even conceptual scenarios um you know performing uh you know interviewing people uh and, and things like that you're not so much you know configuring a firewall or uh, you know, looking at a detection or an alert in a SOC, <clears throat> you're a little bit clo a little bit further away from the actual attacker or a, a real cybersecurity threat. Um, and sometimes GRC, depending on what you do, can be a bit, bit of a tick box and not really, uh, you know, actually trying to change an organisation for the better. I try, I prefer the G, prefer the GR side of GRC, being governance and risk management. For me, compliance is important, but I don't like doing auditing and things like that. Um, and that where, that's where sometimes it can become a little bit of a tick box um, with like IT general controls audits and things like that. Uh, but for like technical, like pen testing or SOC, I think it's, you know, there is minimal report writing. Like for you guys, it's one day out of five, roughly. Um, definitely some of the pros is that, you know, it's closer to, you know, a real attack or threat. You're really simulating what an attacker um, would be doing in terms of targeting a network. Um, and there's kind of an infinite ceiling point for learning. You know, there, there's not really a point where you know everything. 
because as you grow in your role, you'll learn new things, but also the world will change as well. But if, in terms of cons though, there's definitely a high barrier of entry. Um, you know, for example, GRC, we can take someone that has, you know, one year of experience, uh, you know, self-study and have them operate in their role successfully within three months. Uh, it's not the same for like being a digital forensics or a penetration tester. Um, you know, you know, having three years of IT experience or, you know, a degree or, you know, one year of extremely motivated self-study with OSCP or something like that will be what you need to get your first role in one of the, in one of those kind of teams. Um, but I would say for pen testing, well, one of the cons might be as well, um, from a consulting perspective, it can be a little bit rinse and repeat. Um, sometimes if you get stuck just doing one type of test, like web apps only, you might get sick of it and things like that. And also sometimes pen desking can also just be for a tick box as well. Um, you know, often you know, for example, that a client will come back a year later, you do the same test, and you send the same findings again, and they haven't remediated any of them. They just want the report so they can show that they've met the requirement and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that can be a bit of a frustration sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so you mentioned temperament, uh, and also it's easier, like more more jobs available uh, for GRC. So. Mm. Perhaps uh, something people should consider is just to be more uh, flexible. Like if they want to get into cyber, um, consider different options, like different routes to get into cyber. And actually, you can move around quite easily, I think, Absolutely. once you get your foot in the door. Um, so you, you may get into a GRC role and then you want to move to pen testing or whatever, like six months or a year down the line. That's actually a pretty pretty simple, like relatively simple move compared to you're just not in the industry exactly at all, right? right? Yeah, you've proved your value. You know, if you have been able to get a cybersecurity role uh, and done it for a year, whether it's GRC or something like that, um, and then you want to pivot into a SOC analyst, it's a, it's a thousand times easier um, than trying to go from another way around. Uh, but if you, I think if you go a bit too deep into the management route, then would you say it's a bit harder to come back to a technical role? It depends on the person. It really comes down to your own expectations. Um, you know, for example... Right now, for me, if I wanted to be a pen tester, I absolutely could, but I have to be willing to understand that, you know, I've got, you know, five years of experience in another domain. Uh, if I want to be going to a pen testing role, I'm going to have to take a huge salary cut, and that's basically it. It's about your own expectations. I mean, is it easy to move between those roles? Absolutely, but you just have to manage your own expectations. You're not going to be expecting the same salary or benefits if you're going from five years in one day, domain to zero in another or one in a d another. That's mm. the only thing that p that really stops people from doing those changes is they get accustomed to a certain lifestyle. Uh, and also they're probably more comfortable in their role. Yeah. Yeah. I guess after you've done it for like five years or something, it's it's a bit hard to like jump into a completely new field and just like go back to level one again, essentially. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the person. Like some people might be able to find a role that's a combination that's a bit more technical and, and management, you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, in some circumstances, if you want to change from, I don't know, let's say you're, and, you know, I think for GRC to pen testing, it's probably the hardest jump because GRC is more management, business oriented and risk management oriented and pen testing is extremely deep and technical. Whereas if you were a network engineer for five years and you wanted to be a pen tester, that would be an extremely easier transition. You wouldn't have to take as much of a salary cut or anything like that, if, if any, because your skills are very transferable. Whereas from GRC to like pen testing, um, there's not as many transferable skills. From a consulting perspective, there would be in terms of like, you know, how you manage a project, how you speak to customers and all that sort of stuff and how you control scope. But when it comes to actually doing a role, like pen testing a system, um, I mean, you'll have an understanding of like a Windows Enterprise environment and things like that, but you know, it's not it's not hands-on, so it's not as many transferable skills. So, it's w would you say um, some people like say GRC is like talking about cyber security, <laughs> and then pen testing or a SOC analyst is like doing cyber security? <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you say that's pretty accurate? Um, I would say somewhat, yes. Um, it, it really depends because GRC in many businesses can mean so many different things. Uh, in our team, we kind of absorb all of the work that any other team doesn't want to do. We do very detailed risk assessments of, you know, looking at architectures of an entire environment, 
uh, looking at information flows and determining you know what are the risks that exist in the system but yes we may do that discovery through interviews or uh, you know getting someone to share their screen and showing us a configuration so in that regard talking about it yes um, but it's not like we're just having conversations about things and, and that's it yeah 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 and going to that point about um, moving like pivoting within domains in cyber security I've noticed like a lot of people on your team are quite interested in getting into <laughs> pen testing <laughs> yeah. but I think most of them are pretty early in their careers is, mm. is that is that accurate yeah, so we did have one person on our team who was with us for about, I think, nine months, and then they wanted to be a tester. And then I said to them, yeah, absolutely, like, give it a crack, you know what I mean? Um, if you don't like it, you can come back. You know? So the way that I see it is that, you know, at the end of the day, what, what you have an idea of in your head of what you want to do in your role, you know, before you start actually on your journey in security, when you finish your education and when you start your role, you can change so much in that journey. Like, I wanted to do counter fraud, then I wanted to do digital forensics, and now I'm doing GRC. You know, and that's the same for a lot of people. Um, I mean, this person in particular, they, they did medical science, and then they did cybersecurity, and then they did GRC, and then they did pen testing. So I think you know, you'll learn more in your first six months of any security role and get exposed to every other type of function of cybersecurity in that first six months that you may find yourself gravitating to a different area. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it's really random. Like people just mm. jump around a bit and people who get into cyber, their backgrounds are so diverse. Extremely diverse. Extremely yeah. diverse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Um so why don't we talk about um some advice for like young people? Sure. Uh so if someone is like 18 years old and they're considering a cybersecurity career, uh, what would be your recommendations to that person? Like, is it still worth getting a degree, for example, and certifications? Uh, what are your recommendations around that? Well, first things first, I would say that make sure you're interested in cybersecurity for the right reasons. And that is you're interested in understanding, like you're, you're interested in the tech. You have a curiosity and passion about it. Uh, you're not just chasing it for a payday and things like that. So having genuine interest and passion is really important because when it comes to troubleshooting an extremely difficult problem, if you actually are curious and about learning how something works, you'll overcome that challenge. But if you're just doing it because you think it will, you know, is a secure job or it's it will be a good payday or something like that, you'll give up, you know. And yeah, you know. So I think make sure you're doing it for the right reasons in terms of general interest and passion first. Second thing I would do is make sure you stay up to date with what's actually happening in the world. Uh, like what are the threat actors that exist? Like you know, Lazarus Group, North Korea, that sort of stuff. Staying up to date with different type of threat actors in the world, um, whether it's you know, you know, state-sponsored like APTs or organized criminal gangs like ransomware gangs. Look at the techniques that they use to actually compromise an organization. So look at like the MITRE attack framework. Compare that to like a blog post or research post of you know, how an attacker has compromised an organization. And see if you can follow along the steps in that attack framework. Um, I think it's really important. I mean, having an understanding of the, the actual techniques that a threat actor uses is, is almost critical, I would say. Um, absolutely. In terms of after that, after you've kind of done, you know, done the baseline in terms of things, in terms of education, I think it depends on the person, what they would like to do. I think, do you need a degree to get into the industry? Absolutely not. Um, it's not a requirement at all. Uh, it doesn't really mean anything, to be honest. Um, you know, we, we've just hired three people in our team. Uh, one of them has a bachelor's degree, one of them has done an online course, and one of them has had, you know, two years in accounting. And that's, you know, completely different walks of life, and they've all come into the same role. I would say that it really comes down to the person um, and their attitude. You know, do you have the self-discipline to actually, you know, wake up, uh, you know, every single day on time, plan your own schedule, plan your own study schedule, complete certifications, you know, do hack the box, do try hack me, um, you know, do OSCP if you want to be a pen tester, you know, or do some Azure or AWS certs and things like that. You know, do you have the motivation and actually the self-discipline to do that for an extended period of time, like one to two years? But if you don't feel like you have that this self-discipline or that you need more of a mentor, like a teacher, then yeah, absolutely go to university or go to TAFE or, you know, do some on online course or something like that. I think it comes down to the person. Um, I think if you're starting out and you have absolutely no experience or no understanding of security at all, it can be quite overwhelming. Um, so maybe doing a boot camp 
at the very beginning might be a good idea um, or you know an online course or even just looking at cybery and YouTube videos and things like that and then from there uh, finding a few more things to look at I really I'm really fond of um, the cyber mentors um, online trading it's a really like well priced you know less than $25 for courses they always have discounts and I was like all the way down to a dollar um, so I feel like that's a really good start for people uh, yeah yeah so mainly just having that uh, persistence I guess to actually do it like over a long period of time I think that's the benefit of a degree because you're going to university like you have to go right yeah. <laughs> you, have, you have to do, do the thing for like three years but if you're on your own then perhaps it's quite hard to like be um, that like persistent with your self-study or and yeah. that kind of thing uh, but yeah I can, I can totally see how people who are working in like a completely different industry they can do self-study in their own time and then that'll be equivalent to Absolutely. a degree um, for example yeah like if you're you know already a mature age and in your late 20s early 30s and you're in another industry i would say that you know quitting your job and then going and studying full-time at university for three years one probably isn't an option financially but two you know it's not going to be the best decision you know at that point if you're at that if you're at that place i would absolutely just self-study uh you know it, it will involve staying up late night at one o'clock in the morning studying and then going to work at seven and having limited hours of sleep you know your schedule will get crammed but i think that that's a sacrifice you have to be willing to evaluate about you know i'm making this sacrifice for the outcome of getting a new role in an industry that i'm more passionate and care about that, that's probably much better than say you know dropping fifty thousand dollars on a cyber security degree but again uh it, it's really up to people in their own temperament if you find that um, at that age, you, you you know you do that balance of four of self study, you know late nights and things like that for like say six months, and you're not really getting anywhere. Then sure, you know enroll in graduate certificate or a bachelor's degree or something like that. It's really a trial and error. I would recommend that people try the self study route first, see how they go, and then pivot from there. Yeah. Um, so that consistent effort, I actually find you don't actually have to spend that many hours on study like yeah. less than a lot of people think that they need to yeah like for me when i was studying to get into pen testing and now with the uh, smart contract auditing stuff i was only doing like maybe two hours a day uh, on that maybe for like six months or nine months or something like that not that many hours and yeah. it's it's that consistent build up and that um space repetition kind of it's process routine, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah that uh, kind of you just build up your knowledge uh, over time uh, but for for the degrees, uh, you do get some stuff, I guess, like more networking opportunities, yeah, like you, you mentioned earlier, which you don't really get. Like if you're just in your own basement studying, yeah, <laughs> like for for two years and nobody knows who you are, yeah, then you're not going to go anywhere either, right? That's true. Yeah, there, there's definitely an opportunity, um, you know, to get involved with like you know the computer science association at the university or to go to you know career fairs and things like that or have guest lectures come to the university and do talks uh, we do a lot of guest lectures um at our company uh with a lot of universities and things like that so i mean for me i didn't actually even go to them i did a lot of my classes online when i actually studied but you know looking at students now what they have available to them it is really unique um and, and quite valuable um i mean it for me personally like at my stage of my career now you know, I've thought, oh, do I want to do a master's degree? And and really, it's going to add no value. It's going to cost me fifty thousand dollars. I'm better off just spending, you know, five hundred bucks on an Azure cert or something like that. You know what I mean? In terms of development. Um, but yeah, it really depends on the stage of your life that you're at. Yeah. Would you say the degree was actually useful uh, just for yourself? Because yeah, you, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, so I studied counterterrorism, right? So I learned a bunch of stuff that I'm probably never going to apply in my role. Uh, but I was really interested in like national security and things like that. And I think that interest has follow followed along into my role now. So I do a lot of work with you know defense and then like uh, state police and federal government and things like that. Um, I think that, you know, there was a few things that I learned about risk management in my course, which were relevant for security, which I didn't learn in the cybersecurity part. But, you know, we were learning things about like, you know, physical security controls at a prison and like how CCTV cameras work and you know how to like um, you know break into a building using a HVAC system like 
you know, going to the aircon and stuff like that. Like, I, I, that stuff I'm never going to use in security, you know what I mean? But it was really cool. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I would say, you know, I could probably use 20% of what I studied in my role, uh, but I didn't actually study cybersecurity full. Um, but I think it was just l teaching me how to learn, teaching me about how to research, how to write things, how to articulate my thoughts, um, you know, how to articulate a message and things like that. Uh, because in security, a lot of what you do is, from an advisory perspective, is influencing people to make changes to their organization, to their technical environment. Um, you know, trying to get people to make changes and the way that you word a recommendation and things like that can be really important. Yeah, because like cybersecurity degrees, they're relatively new, right? They seem to have just popped up over the past five years, like out of nowhere, every university seems to offer them. Uh, I'm just wondering, are they actually like good? Because like for pen testing, like we have a lot of pen testers that just make fun of what they teach <laughs> in the yeah. degrees and that kind of stuff. Uh, and most people who like actually landed a role, they did a lot of self-learning, like with the mm. OSCP and um, just the learning in their own time so yeah i'm wondering like should people do some research on the university like whether the degree is actually good or not 100 percent, and it comes down to like the longevity of the course like there's four key universities um in our city and two of them have had courses for you know five plus five to ten years one of them have had a course for less than you know a year and one's had for, for two years and the one that's had you know for less than two years and zero years those courses are awful you know, they're not, I would not be enrolling in any of those universities, you know, whereas the other two um, have a really good name for themselves. Uh, I think it comes down to, um, yeah, like the types of lecturers, research the course, look at the course, look at the units, look at the assignments that are linked to the units. Like a lot of universities have an online handbook. You can search the unit name. Uh, you can actually check, you know, what are the assignments, what are the key topics, what are the learning objectives, um, because the the title of the de degree might sound cool, uh, but if you know you look at a cybersecurity course and the whole thing is just all software engineering units, that might not be your thing. Uh, whereas you know if you look at another course, it might be all network security units, and that might be more your thing. Um, so looking for the combination of that is really important. And another factor to think about is the cost of the degree. Like I did my degree ages ago, and the costs were much lower then. And now it's like fifty k. Is that fifty k for a year or fifty k for for the whole no, degree? No, it depends if you're a citizen of Australia or not. Because there's, um, I mean, for me, my course was actually twenty four thousand, but that's because I did counterterrorism with a major in cybersecurity. But I think a cybersecurity degree is like forty to fifty thousand dollars for the whole for the whole three years uh, bachelor's degree course. Um, but if you're an international student, you might be paying that per year. So it's about 150000 or Yeah, that's a just a crazy price. Thousand. Yeah, it's a shitload of money. Um, I, I honestly feel quite bad for international students, to be honest, because they you know, come to here, they spend you know $150,000, $100,000 on their degree, and then they can't get a cybersecurity job because they don't have, uh, they, they don't have a, a, a visa. They only have a temporary student visa. And a lot of work, particularly in cybersecurity consulting, we work with federal government. You have to have either PR, permanent residency, or be a citizen to actually do the work. So we don't hire entry-level people that don't have those working rights. And so a lot of people just end up going and doing Uber driving and Uber Eats and all that sort of stuff. And it's just a waste of like talent and skills, you know. But uh, at the end of the day, that's just the visa process. So yeah, like I don't know, like I just can't really justify that cost in my mind oh, no. i if if i was starting again if i was 18 or something oh, God, I, no. I, I don't think i would go to university to be honest like if you did for example if you want to get into pen testing you did the oscp you get maybe you can get oscp plus a couple of other certifications you would be like more hands-on and have more practical skills than someone that went through a course that was just mainly doing like theoretical yeah kind of stuff yeah for sure it depends on, the, depends on the university. Some universities are more theoretical than others. Um, you know, I know that most of the pen testers in our company, they all went to one particular university uh, and did computer science, actually not cybersecurity. Um, because obviously, as a, in cybersecurity, as a pen tester, you know, having really strong programming skills, uh, a strong understanding of databases, things like that, um, can be really important for your role. But yeah, I'd say like if I was to go back and do it again now, um, I don't think I would, well, for me, I'm glad I did my course, uh, but 
if you're looking at it from a cost perspective purely, um, and you do feel like you have self discipline to study your own way, there's no point in going to university. Yeah, it's a waste of money. Yeah. And you're saying that wouldn't necessarily hurt them when they bring, like they'll give you a CV, you see they, they haven't gone to university, they've done like two years of self-study. That wouldn't necessarily hurt them in the application process. No, um, at least not for our company, no. Um, there will definitely be some businesses that are still in the old way and it's like uh, you don't have a degree, you, don't, you can't even get a walk into the door for an interview, you know what I mean? Like finance, you know, you will not be getting into a in finance unless you have a you know, Bachelor of Commerce or a Bachelor of Finance or whatever. Um, but for security, I think we're a bit more progressive in that way. I think it's because at the end of the day, there's so many roles that need to be filled, there's so much work that needs to be done. We can't put blanket rules on who can have a job and who can't. Um, and at the end of the day, a lot of it is about applying yourself and proving your capability. And at the end of the day, yeah, the, the way that I like to compare cybersecurity is like to art, you know. You can go and do, um, you know, an arts degree, but if your painting looks like shit, you're not going to get a job. You can not go to arts degree school, but you can look at, make a really nice painting and you can sell it, you know what I mean? So it's kind of the same approach. I, mean, I, see, I know plenty of people that I studied with that still can't get jobs because they just never really actually applied themselves or never really learned anything from their course or didn't really put in the effort for their assignments and things like that. Um, versus I know people that, um, you know, there's even a person in our company over east who is 19 and works in cybersecurity. You know what I mean? Finished high school, did a year of self-study, got a job. You know, so it's it really is up to the person. I think the most important thing to learn about this is about your own determination, you know, you can do anything that you put your mind to, you know. You know, we're all humans. All the challenges that we've developed when it comes to security, you know, we can overcome it, you know what I mean? you just got to apply yourself and you've got to be willing to have dedication, commitment and self-discipline and you can do anything. Yeah, 100%. Like, the degree is just sort of there to help you stay consistent and there's a huge difference between people who actually apply themselves and or they just put the minimum effort and they just cram for the exam and then just pass it and get a degree mm. that's like a massive gap there 100 percent. yeah wh which i guess why that kind of devalues degrees a bit almost because you see someone with a degree you can't really tell if they actually like are one of those legit people who studied up quite hard for their degree mm. or is it just like somebody who did the minimum and just got a pass because it's super easy to get a degree if you do the minimum it, 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 honestly the way that i see it it's kind of a thing of the pass I mean, you know, a lot of young people, when they finish high school, their parents say, you've got to go to university. You know, you've got to do something. You've got to go do a course, things like that. And so a lot of people just go to university because their parents tell them to. You know what I mean? I definitely think that my family influenced that on me. They didn't say you had to do it, but it was still my choice, but it definitely had an involvement in my decision-making. And so, and because back then, you know, 20 years ago, it really did set you apart from others. But now it's, you know, it's like candy. Everyone's got it. You know what I mean? Like... It's really not that special. Um, yeah, I don't even think about university at all anymore. Uh, it, do it doesn't help me in my role at the moment, that's for sure. Mm, yeah. Uh, so a lot of people, they talk about skills shortage in cyber, like especially now with the more hacks going on. Uh, but yeah, we still always see students complain about there's a lack of jobs, like those entry-level jobs, um, I guess. Uh, so would you say the jobs are still out there but those students are not like the ones that are applying themselves or would you say it's just less entry level jobs there's just less entry level jobs um you know it's a highly competitive space to get a first job like it's extremely difficult you know i know people that have been studying did a bachelor's degree did two years of certs and still couldn't get a degree i still couldn't get a job you know what i mean and that's more for like when they need to improve on the networking side you know they're just not meeting people but um I would say it's really difficult. Um, I would say it's, well, I, I call it the experience shortage, not the skill shortage, because there's plenty of people that are capable. There's just not enough roles because a lot of roles were asked for, you know, one to two years experience, even for entry level roles and things like that, which I think is stupid personally. Um, but yeah, I, I think it is, it is a real problem. The, the thing is, is that if you think about it from a business's perspective, if they didn't previously think about cybersecurity, and they go, okay, we need to do cybersecurity now. We need to think about this. They want to be able to take someone on that's done it before to help them. They're not saying, okay, let's hire someone who doesn't know what they're doing because we can't risk that. You know what I mean? Um, 
And typically as well, cybersecurity is seen as a cost. You know, businesses exist to make money, or, you know, to produce services and goods. And so any capital that they have, they try and put that back into the process, which is, allows them to pr produce more services or goods and, and create more money. Whereas cybersecurity is a cost. It's an ongoing cost, both in terms of people, but, you know, licenses and things like that. And so spinning up a new role um, isn't just a, an easy exercise. Yeah, yeah um, the entry level, like competition for entry level roles, uh, I do feel it's getting harder and harder. Like, I don't know, like I see people coming in at the associate level now and they've got the OSCP and all that. Yeah. And that was sort of the level I was at when I got a consultant role. So honestly, I, I'm not sure if like if um, I applied now and tried to get in, I'm not sure if I would be in the same position to get that consultant level I straight away or that, that competition. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it's required. Like some people are just like bloody good. You know what I mean? Like really good just by luck. I don't think that it's 100% a requirement that you have to have an OSCP to get a pen testing job. At the end of the day, it's a really easy way for someone to look at a resume and go, I know that this person has at least this minimum level of capability, or they can do this amount of things, right? Um, you know, a lot of the pro, a, lo a lot of your certs and getting a degree, it's just to get from the interview, uh, from the resume review process to the interview. You know what I mean? If you, you might not have a great resume or have a lot of experience, but if you can interview really well, then that is what will help you get a role. Yeah. Yeah. So, what advice would you have? Uh, would you give to people who maybe can't get that entry level role in cyber? Um, do you think cyber is even an entry level job? Because, um, like, m perhaps you would recommend they get into IT or something like that. Like, what's your recommendation? It really depends. Um, like, if you've been looking for a job for two years and you can't get a role, then yeah, maybe you need to do something in the background like IT. But I wouldn't say you have to do IT to get into security. I mean, traditionally, you couldn't study a cybersecurity degree. You know, five to 10 years ago, cybersecurity was a niche IT domain. People would work in an IT role for five to 10 years, and then they would pivot into cybersecurity. And so all the people that are, all the really senior people in our organization come from that background. Um, so I was very fortunate that I was able to get into cybersecurity directly after I graduated, but that's not the case for most people. Um, so if you've been looking, so if someone's been looking for a role and they they can't get a role, I honestly think that they can. They need to just really um, ha be reflective on themselves. You know, honestly journal and really reflect. You know, what is limiting me from a role? If you get rejected from a re interview process, seek feedback. Um, you know, follow up by email to each panelist person after the interview directly and ask for feedback even before you've had an outcome. Um, things like that, you know, improve yourself going forward is, is really important. Because, um, you, again, you may have really good technical skills, but your soft skills may not be sufficient, you know. Um, but, yeah, it, it really depends. I'm not sure if that, that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, um, that's a good answer. Uh, so, yeah, it's going, going back to, like, to the soft skills yeah. kind of thing. And I think people need to approach um, trying to land a job, especially that entry-level job where it, it is the hardest job to get. Um, they kind of almost have to like going back to the OSCP like try harder thing <laughs> like yeah. interviewing is kind of like a skill you have to like keep um, doing over and over again and failing and then eventually like you mentioned before the exposure um, therapy a kind mm. of stuff like it is a skill and then you you will get good at it if you actually do go through the process right mm, absolutely I think like the biggest thing is being genuine um, you know showing people the real side of yourself um, you know, if you're, you know, going into an interview particularly, people can get quite anxious. You know, I, I, I like to say at the start of the interview, you know, uh, if you are anxious, say it. Like, just so you know, I'm a little bit anxious. I really, really care about this opportunity. Um, so if you see me uh, take a little bit too long to answer a question, just know that I'm investing some time because uh, I want to give you a detailed and thought out response. So things like that, having really casual conversational pieces when you're having an interview with someone makes it less like robotic and structured and more kind of free flowing and it shows that you know you're a human just like them um, and that you're you know you're passionate and you're eager you're hungry but that you are you know a little bit anxious and things like that because when I, when I say about these like developing these soft skills because obviously there's people who are introverts some people are extroverts um, you know we're not just hiring people which are all extroverts and can all approach people on the street and things like that you know what I mean 
It's a combination of both. I think the biggest thing when it comes to an interview is one, actually, you know, one, answering the question that you're actually asked, um, breaking it down into pieces and responding. Um, two, if you don't know what you're talking about, just say, I don't know how to answer that question without trying to, you know, bullshit your way through it. And, um, yeah, I think focusing on how you articulate an answer is quite important. Yeah, that's pretty good interview tips. Um, a lot of these communication tricks that you can throw in there to uh, help yourself, like, be more articulate and mm. get better at interviews. For sure. Uh, so... What about for people who are maybe in this industry already and they want to progress their career um, quickly? Uh, do you have any advice on that? Yeah, con continuous learning. I mean, a lot of people think that it's this massive tranche of self-study and education and things. And when you get the job, you're good. That's it. And you can stop and you can kind of settle back down. But, I mean, for me, cybersecurity isn't just my job. It's things that I, I do it on, every night after work. I do it on the weekend. And not work, but like self-study, research, watching videos, looking at news articles, things like that. Continuously improving and learning is something that you will do in the first five to 10 years of your career. Um, and I think that's really important. You know, continually investing yourself, um, putting yourself out there, giving new things a go. Um, you know, some people can set core beliefs like they're not, good enough to do certain things or not smart enough to do certain things but overcoming that and giving everything a crack because when I started in security people would say oh no you don't do OSCP until you had two years of pen testing experience you know what I mean or you don't do CISSP until you've had five years of cybersecurity experience but you know that's just what that's just what someone's opinion is you know you can do anything you want um, so don't be afraid of trying to go to the expert level straight away yeah yeah You've got the CISSP. You yeah. did it before the five years, I think. And yeah, I did do yeah. it before the five years. People did tell me, um, you, know, you know, do the security plus, and then a few years later, do the CISSP. And I thought, well, they look pretty similar. Why don't I just do the CISSP straight away? And I was, you know, I was 19. I had uh, maybe three months of cybersecurity experience. And I thought, oh, oh wow. 19, 21, sorry. It was a while ago. Um, th 21, and I had like, you know, three months of experience. And I thought, yeah, no, what? Well, like, here we go. You know what I mean? So I did the self-study, no boot camps. I did, went on Cybery, watched a lot of videos by uh, Kelly, I think, Han Hannison. She was really good. Um, and just kind of taught myself everything. And then went into an interview, an interview, uh, the exam, Pearson uh, View, and I passed, which was crazy. Nice. I, actually, I actually thought I was going to fail. Um, I was like, remember when I had a hand in because you do the exam and they hand you the letter straight away and it tells you whether you pass or fail. You don't have to wait like OSCP. Yep. Um, and I was like completely shitting myself. I was like, I actually did it on Boxing Day, so the day after Christmas. So I'd been spending like my entire Christmas break of work, like studying all the way through, through Christmas Day. The next day I did it and I passed. I was like, thank God. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that must have been. Like the exam is so expensive as well. Like if you fail, you had to pay the pay the full one, amount, 1,000 or something. Well, again. It's, it's 700 US dollars, but in Australia we have GST, goods and services tax, so it's plus 10%. So it's 770 US dollars. And because the exchange rate is quite low, it was like 1,200 Australian dollars yeah. for me to do it. Um, which is crazy because, you know, in 2012, one Australian dollar was equal to one US dollar, but now it's like 70 cents to the dollar. Uh, but yeah, if you fail, you pay the full $1,200 again. Um, I actually did something called skill set, I think it was called. So I did like 6,000 practice multiple choice questions or something like that. And I had to get 90% and in, in above or something like that higher. And they said to me, if you can do that and you fail your, your CISP exam, we'll pay you for the uh, the second attempt. Oh, so nice. some kind of platform where it was like, you know, you pay us a hundred bucks for training or a hundred dollars for the course or $200 for the course or whatever it was. You know, if you meet all this criteria, and you fail the CISP, we'll pay for the second one. So I was like, great. Because in my mind, I was like, you know, at the time that I did the exam, my work was said, they said, um, we will pay for you to do the CISP, but we'll only pay if you pass. And so I thought, okay, if I fail, you know, $1,200 at the time was like, you know, a third of my paycheck, you know? So that was a significant amount of money to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, nice. <laughs> you got you got it early. <laughs> yeah, I got it early, uh, and then you know waited five years of well, waited four years of experience. Uh, so five years of the experience requirement minus one for a bachelor's degree is four years. So four years of experience, I now have the CISSP. Uh, so I just kind of waited and then got it. So yeah, yeah, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Has that yeah. helped you like in your career as well? Do you think? I think that studying it early on really helped me in my role, particularly for GRC. 
um, as it talks a lot about risk management, governance, and it's kind of, you know, the CISSP, they often call it a mile wide and an inch deep, because you kind of go to like a foundational to intermediate level of knowledge in the seven, eight or nine domains. I can't remember how many there are. So I found it really useful to understand not just about what my role is, but about how all these other um, teams like SOC analysts, engineers, um, and all these other teams are working and operating. So I thought that was really useful. Yeah, yeah awesome. Um, so let's talk a bit about uh, building a personal brand. Uh, I know we talked about networking sure. uh, previously before as well. Uh, do you think that is very uh, a big factor in like getting promoted, getting ahead in your career? I would say it's not not really needed to get promoted or anything like that. Like building a personal brand, well, well you've got your internal brand and your external brand. You know, internal being within your team and your company, and external being other people in the industry that know you. I think an internal brand is absolutely important. You know, are you accountable, dependable? Uh, are you respected? Are you trustworthy? Um, do you follow through with things? Uh, you know, if, if you say to someone, I'm going to help you with this project or I'm going to get this risk assessment done for this date and you get it done on time consistently, that's really important, um, absolutely. Um, but if I wouldn't say that having an external brand outside of your team is required to get a promotion in your company. Um, that's more of uh, just an opportunity to do things externally. So like when I say do things externally, you know, if you have an external brand outside of your company, you might get invited to be speaking at conferences or um, speaking at networking events or, you know, uh, you get to learn about, you know, cool people in other cool roles and things like that and just build relationships. I, I never set out on a journey where I was like, I'm going to build a personal brand or anything like that. It was more just, I wanted to meet cool people. I wanted to learn more about what other people did in their roles, how it was different from mine, um, you know, what their learnings from their career was and how I could kind of take that into my own, you know, version and move that into my life moving forward and things like that yeah yeah nice um so that external brand like i, I see you um on linkedin like <laughs> doing the community yeah. reach out and all yeah. that kind of stuff that that's 100 percent um gonna help with your external brand and uh, also speaking at security conferences you've done quite a bit of a conference talks recently uh, around australia i think and actually last year when you did the b-sides talk yeah. in perth that was actually how <laughs> I first noticed the Web3 security industry. Uh, That's crazy, honestly. Yeah, yeah honestly, like, <laughs> <laughs> like how how people's careers kind of progress is so random sometimes, eh? Mm. Uh, yeah, because I, I saw that conference talk and before I, when I looked at um, Web3 and crypto and that stuff, I was like, yep, scam, crap. <laughs> and then, but uh, like approaching it again from mm. a security perspective, um, actually made it super interesting to me and i think a lot of um pen testers or, or like traditional cybersecurity people they uh they don't really like understand the crypto and web3 enough or they just think it's all scam and just like crap yeah. um yeah so speaking at conferences um uh, obviously uh really good for like building that kind of uh external uh, brand as well yeah absolutely i mean i mean coming to like the web3 stuff for me i mean I'm not like a smart contract order or anything like that, but I found it just as like a new puzzle. Like it's a new challenge that not many people are involved in. And that's very fascinating and intriguing. Um, and that's what kind of motivated me, me to do that, a talk on, um, I just essentially did a talk on, uh, you know, the original uh, DAO hack, um, which caused the fork of Ethereum Classic to what we now have as Ethereum um, through the, you know, reentry attack. Um, I found it really interesting. Uh, and I kind of just did a case study talk about what the attack was. It was more of an educational piece because uh, we hadn't really had any like Web3 security talks at B-Sides um, in Perth. Um, that was really cool. But in terms of doing talks, I never really set out to say that I, that's something that I wanted to do. I kind of slowly built up to it um, and kind of had like essentially built credibility in that space in order to be able to do bigger conferences. So for me, when I first, well, the first thing I did was I did a guest lecture at a university uh, one of the one of the lecturers reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, "Hey, do you want to do a guest lecture about um, enterprise security and governance at university?" And I said, "Sure." So I came in, did a presentation in front of some students, which they recorded and put online, and I really enjoyed it. It was really awesome. And then I kind of threw my hat in the ring at B-Sides Perth 
about a year later, which was last year, and did a talk on yeah re-entry re attacks on smart contracts, which I thought was really cool. And again, I'm not a smart contract auditor, uh, but I did do a bit of talked about like you know application security and things like that in the talk. But yeah, it was just an opportunity to kind of give something a go. It was a really good um, environment. B sides is very supportive about giving people that haven't had an opportunity to talk a go, which I think is really cool. Um, also, they kind of exist to essentially, it's essentially like a not-for-profit. Like the cost is $50, you get food paid for, it's a two-day conference, all these things included. It's a really great event. I don't know how it runs in like other cities and states, but I've always like dreamt about going to like B-sides like San Francisco and things like that. Um, but after I'd kind of done that, I had like a, you know, a semi-credible or some more definitely credible conference talk on my resume. Um, and I applied for the Australian Information Security Association um, National Cyber Conference in Melbourne um, to do a talk on instant response exercises and got accepted, which was also really cool. Um, and that was a couple of weeks ago. So that was great. Yeah, yeah nice. Yeah, you, you did a practice of that talk <laughs> in, internally. Yeah, I yeah. kind of stuffed that up, actually, to be honest. <laughs> like, I picked the worst time to do a practice. I practiced the talk on like a Friday at 4 p.m. And I'd been in back-to-back -back meetings for like maybe five hours and so I hadn't had, had any water. My throat was raspy and dry. And like, I just talked so quickly through the presentation. And that's something that I learned um, going, I'm so glad that I did that practice before doing the real one, because I learned that, you know, when you present at a conference, it's not just about having the craziest, coolest topic to talk about. Sometimes it's about how you talk, you know, how you convey a message. And speaking really quickly about a technical concept, you're gonna lose people. So it's really important that you know you pace your words, you know you you speak certain sentences and let uh, you know take pauses to let certain words sink in and things like that. Yeah, yeah. nice. Uh, how many? So you did the uh, B sides and then uh, so you did two conferences essentially. Now. Yeah, just two yeah. conferences. And are you planning to do more? Well, I definitely want to submit a talk to DefCon in um, Las Vegas next year. That'll be awesome. Uh, which would be really sick. Um, and I've been working with a, a colleague actually about submitting a talk to that. I kind of put it on the back burner a little bit as applications don't typically open until May uh, next year. So we're in uh, November now, so it's still about five months. And so I'm going to start working on that talk towards probably February, March next year. Um, and that'll be a more of a security research oriented talk. It'd be really interesting because all the talks I've done have not really been related to my role at all. Um, I've found that like, you know, no one really wants to hear a talk about how to do a risk assessment or how to write a policy. <laughs> like, it's probably like the most boring thing, you know. Uh, but I'm very interested in security research um, and just talking about things that interest me and intrigue me. So, um, but to, to get a talk submitted and accepted at like Black Hat or DEF CON, you really do, well, Black Hat has to be quite technical. So for me, I'm probably not going to submit to that. DEF CON, maybe to one of the blue team villages or something like that might be a good option. Um, but I'm kind of like, with my other person that I'm working along, we're trying to figure out what we actually want to talk about. We're kind of in that phase at the moment where we're still trying to do the security research and discover something that's different or new or interesting. Because at those, at those type of events, at that level, you really do have to present like a new finding, you know, or a, or a discovery, yeah. Hmm, very interesting. Yeah, I hope you get that, get that <laughs> talk, Thanks, yeah. That'll be really cool speaking at DEF CON. Um, so for like getting that first job, I'm just going back to that topic sure. again, like um, building a LinkedIn profile is probably like a really good uh, way to get that uh, networking started. Uh, how would you recommend a student uh, go about building their LinkedIn profile and reaching out to people and that kind of stuff, like if they start from essentially zero connections? Yeah, I think the big thing that people think about is well how can i have a resume or linkedin if i haven't got work experience but i think it's you know you've got to focus on capabilities and skills well first of all one have a profile picture which is good like in sunshine shows your face smiling you know not like you know hiding in your bedroom sitting on the floor or something like that in a dark space like simple things like that can be really good um you know in your uh your profile overview you have an option for description put in a description about you know, that's the first thing someone's gonna read when they look at your profile. You don't want it to be an essay, but you want it to be at one paragraph or one and a half paragraphs, quite concise. And I, I would recommend that people put in there, well, one, what motivates 
you and in why are you passionate about cybersecurity? You know, what roles are you interested in and are you seeking? And what capabilities or skills do you think you've developed or are wanting to grow into? And so, I mean, it's very easy for me to say that, but to answer those questions on your resume or on, on your LinkedIn profile is really difficult. Because, you know, it, when it comes to like motivation, you can't just say, oh, it's a growing industry, like, like I talked about a bit earlier on. You really need to talk about, you know, what motivates you. You know, it might be, I'm really interested in um, understanding how a threat is able to pivot laterally, move throughout a network and things like that. And therefore, I'm seeking a role as a pen tester or something like that, you know. So that's what I would focus on. Going down to work, uh, your work experience, you don't want to put your full work experience. Like if you're, let's say you're, you know, your mid-20s and you've worked at like 10 cafes, McDonald's, Red Rooster, and like that's it, maybe put one of those roles down, the most recent one, um, because you really want to be shaping your LinkedIn to be targeting the industry you want to move into. You don't want to be like, I've been in retail for 15 years and that's only where I'm going to go. I would only include the most recent role or if you're, your most recent role isn't technical or, or IT or anything like that related, include something else. If you're just studying, it can be enough just to put your course down and nothing else. Um, there's also at the bottom of your profile LinkedIn opportunity to put skills and capabilities. So like, be quite specific. Don't just say cybersecurity uh, or information security. Say like, um, PowerShell scripting or like bash scripting or um, you know things like that yeah hmm. yeah nice good tips uh, okay let's uh, talk a bit about uh, leadership and your yeah. position uh, as a manager yeah. so how many what, what size of the team that you're managing at the moment so in, inside the CX it's a little bit different because a manager doesn't actually have direct reports it's more about managing complex engagements um, so I don't have any direct reports in terms of managing their, say, like performance reviews, setting salary or anything like that. I'm much more involved from a development perspective, you know, onboarding a new hire, um, setting them up with their IT, um, showing them how to work on a project, teaching them about you know, business acumen, um, you know, the commercials, um, you know, general cybersecurity foundational skills and things like that. So that, that's kind of what my role is. But when it comes to managing complex projects, I assume that kind of technical or program lead role um, as a manager, manager of the project. Um, and so sometimes I can have, whether it's one person that's supporting me through to like, you know, it could be three, four, five people. It could be people in other teams, like in pen testing and things like that. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Hmm. Yeah, I've noticed you like onboarding like helping with that kind of stuff already, like way before you got, um, yeah. you know, like you're showing people around the around the office and all that kind of stuff. Like I think you've been doing a lot of this stuff already and maybe that was why. Uh, yeah, I think like there's been definitely circumstances where, you know, well, we're a growing company, right? And some people are joining a team where they don't actually have a manager in their state, they might be in another state, they're working remotely. So when they start, they don't necessarily get, necessarily get shown around the office or, you know, showing where all things are. And you can see them like in the kitchen, like trying to figure out which draws the bin or things like that. And it's like, all right, I'm gonna say hello to this person. And then like talk to them about, you know, how they got into the industry, show them around the office and things like that. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, um, that definitely helps like create a more like a camaraderie and a good working environment. Absolutely, like people can get quite anxious about that sort of stuff. And, you know, if I was starting somewhere new, I would, would want someone to do that for me. So. Yeah. And yeah, it's really great that you, you've kind of just stepped up and just did that kind of stuff <laughs> just by yourself. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so like creating a good working environment, um, that kind of stuff, like this is my first uh, job in cybersecurity as a full-time penetration tester. And you know, I've heard some like horror stories of like other companies like Big Four or, <laughs> or something, yeah. I won't name names, but definitely I've heard like people talk about um, how they are not uh, the best places to work for. <laughs> Let's just uh, put it that way. Um, I, maybe I like dodged a bullet or something, but uh, people like on my YouTube channel as well, they keep asking me whether uh, like being a consultant is stressful or not. And I'm like, I don't think so. I'm pretty, it's pretty chill. Yeah, like <laughs> I've got pretty reasonable yeah. working hours. Uh, so why do you think that is? I think it's big force specifically, like globally, 
are quite renowned for going through like the churn and burn model, which is essentially, you know, they onboard 10 graduates, they expect them to say max two or three years, and then they replace them with more every year. And the, the reason that is, is that at their advantage and set very unreasonable working hours like 60, 70, 80 hour weeks sometimes um, which is you know if you're looking at like investment banking and finance people work even more than that like 90 hours um, and so that kind of expectation of working hours then flows on into like IT audit and GRC and pen testing and things like that and any other subject roles at Big Four and so people end up working ridiculous hours and it starts to become like it's not a supportive environment it's not a place where, you know, you know, if you're not getting a good night's sleep, you're rocking up to work at tight every day, you're, you know, getting unreasonable expectations and demands, you're not getting support for growing and learning. Why would you want to work somewhere like that? You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I, I think it's toxic. You know, we've had a recent incident in Australia where, you know, not in cybersecurity, but someone worked at a big four and they jumped off the top of their cafe at the building Jesus. and killed themselves, you know? So, like... That just goes to show you the type of a work environment that they have. Like, um, that's that's not somewhere that I would want to work at all. Um, I, a two experience I had um, working for a similar organization, not in the big four, but a very very similar brand, um, say Big Ten or something like that. But um, I, you know, I think I had a. Essentially, I worked there for 10 weeks and then quit and then came back to my job. <laughs> um, but, you know, the way that I see it is that you kind of treat it as a resource, not a person, to achieve an, an objective. And they don't care about the impact on your own life. You know, you're essentially a, an object to be used to achieve a, a business outcome. You know what I mean? Um, so I remember going on the weekend to, like, pick up, a, like, a jacket that I left on a chair and like looking over the corner and seeing like a girl crying at her desk saying like, I can't do this anymore. And I thought, okay, I, I cannot work here. I gotta go and I quit. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I, I didn't quit straight away, but I spoke to like some people and they were like, holy shit, like that's horrible. You should not, like I, that wasn't like, I saw, I only saw one person cry, but I've seen a lot of people like rock up to work with like, you know, like bags under their eyes. We had a long weekend for Easter or something like that. It was a public holiday on the Monday and I came on a Tuesday and I was like, how was your long weekend? And they're like, what long weekend? They're like, they were, hit, they were here every day. I'm like, oh my God, like, this is going to be me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I quit and actually came back to the job that I left, yeah. um, which was very fortunate that I had the opportunity to do that. Mm. But this is not like a single story. This is not a, this has just happened to me. Like every person that I know that has worked at those organizations has had a bad experience. Um, I think that does that mean if you get an opportunity to work at one of those organizations, you have to turn it down? I would say no. I think it's about asking the right questions in the interview process and asking for examples. Like if you ask someone, is it a great place to work at your organization? They go, yeah, it's great. Well, that, that's not the right type of question you want to ask. You're going to say, what's your retention like? How many people stay for more than two years? You know, those sorts of questions are well, the questions that you want to ask in the interview process. You know, do you spend time with your team outside of work hours? You know, what's the standard working hour week? Like, those are really hard questions that people have to give you real measurable answers to. Um, so, yeah. I would also say that, you know, sometimes the, t the team, uh, you can get a good team in a bad business. Like, some of the big four might be toxic in terms of the, how they operate, but you might have a really good manager that is a great person and they can shield you from a lot of that stuff. And so that could be an opportunity where you go, you know what, I'm going to work here for two years. I know the manager's really good uh, or I have a friend that works there and they're going to look after me. Then sure, take that opportunity to get your foot in the door. But it's not somewhere that I would look to establish a long-term career. Mm. It might be good to have that on your CV though, right? Yeah, I mean, definitely for outside of security, like more big business, they can see, oh, you know, if you've got those business names on your res uh, resume, they might think, okay, this person, you know, can operate in a high pressure environment they you know have a lot of different communication skills consulting and things like that but there's a lot of cybersecurity companies out there that you can choose um to work for so you know there's also depending on which big four company you're in um there's uh different people uh 
have opinions on whether they actually know what they're talking about when it comes to security and technical knowledge. Because a lot of people will do accounting, go and work at a big four, change departments, and then go into cybersecurity, don't get taught how to do it, be, be a cybersecurity specialist, and then are working on projects and making recommendations that don't make sense. That happens a lot. Um, so yeah, I think it really depends. So you would say you haven't actually personally experienced some of those horror stories. It was more of like watching the other people and how they were just getting like hammered by the environment. Yeah, I mean, part of the reason why I left as well is because I have some like complex health problems and I needed to like work from home quite often. Um, not even quite often, like two days a week for a certain week and then one day a week. And I was being like told to like, do like a massive report, like 40 page report, and it's due tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And I'm leaving the office at 4 p.m. And I'm like, what do you mean it's due at 9 a.m.? Like, they're like, you've got to get it done. And I'm like, I don't want to stay here till 10 p.m. You know, like I could see it starting to happen. I had set my boundaries quite well. I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, and that actually caused frustrations in the team because everyone else was doing it, but I wasn't doing it, you know. Um, so it was getting applied onto me. Um, and that was kind of what, help me form my decision to kind of leave yeah but was the salary like much higher than like would normal job you would say or was just pretty like comparable well i asked for a certain number and they actually offered me ten thousand dollars more than that when i started in the role um but i think it was more so because at the time i didn't have a really good understanding of what security salaries were and so i kind of like asked what i thought i should be paid but i didn't know how much people were actually willing to pay um, I moved after having two years of experience into a new role and I actually got like a 40% pay rise from my original company role. Um, but I think that was just, uh, I mean, in terms of the pay they offered me, it was, it was fair, uh, but it wasn't like anything crazy. Mm. I think um, they're getting better for sure. Um, but I think it, it slows down quite a lot after, say, three years experience. Mm. Right. Yeah. There might be a lot of progressive, really big hops. Like you might start on 60 and go to 70, then 80. Uh, let's say 60 to 80 to 100 in the first two years, right? Uh, but then, you know, you might be at like 100, 105, 110, 115, like every year after that. So it might start to slow down. Right. Yeah. That That's in um, like big four. Mm. Like I know that, like you can just go on glassdoor.com.au or levels.fyi and you can type in like roles um, and you can figure out the salary ranges that they pay. Like a manager at one big four might get paid a certain amount and then in a boutique consultant they might get paid a lot more. So it depends. Hmm. And you just thought that was not worth it. <laughs> well, look like this, right? I was willing to f sacrifice a 40% pay rise that I'd received from that pr leaving that company and going to this big four company. And I was willing to sacrifice a 40% pay rise to go back, you know, like... We'll talk about numbers. So I went from 55K to 85K, uh, and I was willing to go back to 55K after leaving that company, you know? Um, but very fortunately, I didn't have to do that. They actually offered me more when I came back, which was mm. quite, you know, surprising, to be honest. But um, they wanted me back, which was really good. Yeah, so they, they realized they needed you. <laughs> <laughs> I was very, fr I mean, they, I was, you know, they could have, they could have fucked me. Like, they could have. They could have said, you know, you can have 55 again. Here you go. You know what I mean? But they respected me and they actually offered me more than I left for, which mm. is really good. So it actually worked out really well. And I haven't left since then. And I've had a lot of reviews and they've been very fair. So, um, yeah, I'm so glad that I'm here now. That's for yeah. sure. Nice, nice. Um, I, can, I think maybe job hopping in cybersecurity is a good way to get that pay rise as well. Because, mm. um, I don't know, I think... I think um, this company is pretty good uh, at just giving you pay rises that actually go, go to the uh, market rates. Yeah. But still, I think if you hop a few times, you can actually go above market rates sometimes. Absolutely. I think the biggest pay rises will come from changing jobs because you have the most leverage, right? You know, if you're, it, it, when it comes to negotiating anything, it comes down to leverage. You know, if you've not talked about salary through the entire interview process, They've got to the end and they go, you know, we really love this person. We want them on as soon as possible. And then they offer you a number and you go, oh, sorry, I really want to work here, but that's just not enough. They are going to go back to their business, make a request, increase the salary, increase the benefits, increase the equity if it's available. Um, and that's when you have the most leverage to get what you want. Whereas if you're in an organization and, um, you know, you're employed full time, 
you know, you don't really have any leverage. You know, in, in your performance review process, they will have to pay you enough to retain you, but they don't have to pay more than that. Because in the, the day, I mean, particularly for consulting, like we are the product we, that we sell time for money, and so essentially they're incentivized to pay you enough to essentially retain you and not more than that. I think yeah, pay rises. The biggest pay rises will come from changing roles, because um, that's when you have the most leverage, right? Um, you've convinced someone that they really want you and you can ask for more and more until you sign the contract. But when you're in an internal role, um, they just have to pay you enough to retain you. Um, you know, if you're in consulting, you know, we are the products, they're selling time for money. And ultimately, the way they calculate their profit margin is based upon how much we pay the person, you know, all the other standard things like office space, laptop, etc. So they have a cost price and then the sale price and then the margin is the profit, right? And the more pay raises they give you, the more it eats into that margin. It might, so it might go from 60% to 55%. And so really, they're incentivized to pay you enough to retain you um, unless you have you know, something special, like you have a certain skill that no one else has. Um, you, know, you serve a different function of the organization that they can't really put a price on. Like you might have really good relationships with other parts of the business. Um, you know, you might be more involved in sales and helping, giving a helping hand, things like that. So when it comes to like, you know, you know, earning your value and increasing your salary and things like that, my recommendation to people is to play a vital role in your organization. Um, don't just do, you know, the, the minimum standard is the job description. You should be a aiming to do a lot more than that, um, you know, to be successful in your role. Take on any opportunity that you can to improve, even if you start to feel your workload's getting too much. Um, you know, you'll, you'll build relationships, you'll prove to people that you're capable, and you'll get more opportunities to do that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you've navigated your career very well. Uh, what are your future goals? Yeah, to be honest, like, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, at the moment, I'm studying for my OSCP. Oh, nice. Um, which I've been doing for about... I've casually been doing it technically for two years, <laughs> but I've kind of realized, you know what, this is something that I actually really want to do. Um, I did a few like England security courses, um, the EJPT, uh, maybe two years ago. I've done some hacked box and try hack me and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, for me, when I first started in cybersecurity, um, because I didn't do like a cybersecurity course, I did counterterrorism. I kind of, I don't know, had convinced myself that I wasn't technical enough or I wasn't. Uh, smart enough to do that sort of stuff um, and so for me it's been like a, a challenge it's been a real challenge it's not something that I the OSCP wouldn't actually kind of add a crazy amount of value to my role currently um, they definitely would help for sure um, in terms of any respect from stakeholders that I'm interviewing maybe uh, but in terms of you know I don't do any pen testing in my role I don't do anything like that but it's a challenge that I see as something that is highly valuable um, I see the skills as very useful. I enjoy it. I have fun with it. I like doing CTFs and stuff like the WACTF we're going to do later this year. Um, and so that's that's something that I want to do. I think that um, I long term will pivot into a more technical role, um, whether that's my current organization or elsewhere. I'm not sure yet. Um, but I, I haven't said this is what I'm going to do. I'm kind of just taking things one day at a time. Um, in GRC, something that does happen is when you get further up the chain in terms of progression and roles, um, you do become more uh, business oriented and more financial oriented and things like that. And I definitely have a fear of losing my kind of security expertise and just becoming like a, a good manager and not really a security professional in a way. And so I definitely will make sure for me personally that I'm always continuously learning, staying up to date with threats uh, you know, attack techniques, things like that, doing security research, and, you know, I want to finish the OSCP. So long term, what type of roles can I see myself pivoting into? I'm not entirely sure, but I've always had the dream of going to the US and, and working in cybersecurity for a couple of years, and I still want to do that. Um, so I think at some point in the next five years, I want to move to Austin, Texas in the US and work in big tech and do cybersecurity. So like a typical like fang type role um but yeah it's a security engineer or something like that but i'm kind of just taking it one day at a time at the moment 
see we'll see what happens mm, nice yeah that's interesting uh, so you you t- t- you decided to go for the OACP because you want to keep that technical side of you Absolutely. still like progressing um, not just seeing yourself go like straight into a non-technical management um, type of role so you have more flexibility uh, moving forward exactly because um, you know if in I don't know two years I go or a year I go you know what I do want to do something else I want to I don't know, do threat hunting or something like that um, or be a security engineer um, that jumping from GRC at that point being f- that far in like five to six years in may start to prove challenging um, and I don't want to take a massive pay cut and go back to a, a full entry level role in that new discipline I, w- I would be willing to take a pay cut but I wouldn't want to be willing to like take a 75% pay cut you know what I mean mm. so t- staying up to date with my technical skills um, will be really important so if I in the future want to make that you know uh, transfer into a new domain of security I think that'll be really important yeah yeah that's that's a good idea um, I guess that's uh, for people who's not sure of whether they want to like actually progress into management later in their career just keeping up with the technical side of things will give you more options yeah there, there's other technical domains within GRC that I can go into like PCI DSS like payment card industry data security standard like assessments um, and IRAP assessments which is in Australia the Information Security Registered Assessors Program, IRAP. And that's we do like quite technical assessments of like federal government and things like that. But for me, I think I've hit the limit of, I just don't like audits. And so um, those were, whilst they're assessments, they're very audit-like. Um, and for me, long, for me long term, I want to be transferring more into doing things. Yep. Yeah. Hmm, nice, nice. Or building things, yeah. Building things. Yeah. Yeah, I guess pen testing, you're like destroying things. <laughs> you <laughs> want to get into building <laughs> things. <laughs> maybe, not, maybe not building things then, but um, destroying things. Yeah, that sounds yeah. good. <laughs> we'll see. We'll it's fun. <laughs> it's like playing a game or something. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think I'll say blue team for long term. I don't think I'll go red team or I don't want to be a pen tester personally, um, which sounds quite strange for someone that's sitting, sitting in the OSCP. Um, but I think it's very valuable to have a strong understanding about how an attacker operates um, in any role that you do in security. Um, for like for me, if I interviewed a person that had OSCP and they wanted to be GRC, I'd probably hire them straight away. You know what I mean? Like, um, because someone has that technical understanding about at, uh, not only how, you know, you can actually move in an environment, like have an understanding of Active Directory, how that works, um, have an understanding of exploits within, you know, misconfiguration certificates, um, you know, just common AD attack scenarios, things like that can be really useful in any role in security yeah, yeah. and um, I've seen you like did uh, you did some work for digital forensics as well for a couple yeah. of months and you're going for the OACP yeah definitely keeping that um, technical side um, active and progressing yeah I did like a short secondment in an intelligence analyst role which is in our digital forensics team um, I actually originally moved to the team because well I did intelligence and counterintelligence when I studied at university and I thought maybe I might better get more involved in like, you know, well, what I'd always been interested in, in is reading like security research, like blogs, you know, that does like re- reverse engineering of malware, figuring out where the threat actors from, what jurisdiction, what group or what APT they might be from, things like that, writing, you know, complex blogs about how, with, with, with IOCs and, and how people can, um, you know, use those detections in, in their own organization and things like that. But, but in our intelligence team in our company, it's a bit more about uh, like policy and geopolitics and, and more that kind of stuff than say technical, you know, reverse engineering and things like that. So I actually finished the secondment and then I came back to GRC because I just didn't think it was uh, the best fit for me. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just the note about pen testing, like I don't think that pen testing is that technical. I. I it's not as technical as I imagined it to be. I'm um, not sure if you agree with that because I've been just doing like try hack me, hack the box, and then pretty much was like was able to transition very well to like an actual pen testing job. And like the most of the stuff that we do is like the really basic dumb shit, you know, <laughs> yeah, just like poning yeah. people with the most basic stuff over and over again. Yeah. And it's not even necessary to go like too deep into like the exploit development and no, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that like from outsider's perspective, and I definitely had this privacy, is that it's quite like unicorn, you know, and you think it's like magical and that, oh my God, they hacked me, you know, or they hacked the company and it's like, what is going on? You know what I mean? 
um, but really no, like it's it's not that crazy. Um, it's really just about developing a good approach, method like your own methodology for like information gathering. You know, like they say, enumeration is like the most important thing. Um, so I mean, from someone like myself who I can't do any programming at all, other than like a bit of Bash scripting and PowerShell scripting, um, I'm finding it pretty easy to navigate. Um, you know, and that I mean, I've been doing it slowly over quite a long time, but I'm halfway through the material at the moment for the OSCP and. I'm finding it um, like pretty straightforward, to be honest. Yeah, mm. I think you know once I get into some more technical, higher labs, uh, we'll see how I go. Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> when are you planning to set the exam? I don't have a date in mind at the moment. Um, I'm actually renovating a house at the moment, so I don't really have a good place to like sit down and yeah. focus. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I probably will start um, really going into it at January and probably sit maybe March. Yeah. Yeah, nice. So that, still that's about five months or three yeah. months away yeah. oh it's not that far yeah well, we're gonna be, get there pretty soon it'll be there before you know it for yeah. sure okay so um i can't let you go f- without talking about runescape <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Now, so runescape we it's kind of like the game of our childhood and yeah. i posted a video um on my channel uh where i made some scripts and i botted my account to max and yeah. to this day I think that's still my second most viewed video with like 18,000 views or something. Yeah, it's crazy. And to this day, people are still leaving comments on my videos. <laughs> They're like, where's the RuneScape videos, bro? We don't care about the security stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, people, man, like, can you describe this, the sort of, um, you know, like, it's so hard to get away with that game, like, honestly. I made the botting scripts to like in a way to help me quit the game <laughs> oh my <laughs> like, god really like oh okay I, I finally got it out of my system i, I can quit the game now yeah and people are still like well where's the runescape videos bro <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like no please i don't want to get dragged into this game again yeah yeah it's pretty addicting um you you've been playing it since you were a kid yeah. um, as well <laughs> too long too long oh I, I don't know i've had periods of maybe i should define what runescape is for people that don't know what it is I mean, RuneScape is like a, a ma- it's an MMORP- MMORPG, so a mass multiplayer online role-playing game. It's basically like fighting dragons, medieval castles, and it's this world where you can run around and train skills and you know learn fire making and magic and m- melee and things like that. Um, but it's a m- multiplayer game, so you can trade with players, um, and that's where things like leveling up accounts, like botting, to like get gold, so you can sell gold and things like that. Um, comes into play i mean i've been playing runescape since 2007 when i was literally you know, less than 10 years old so i've been playing now for 15 years <laughs> 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 Shit. Shit. that sounds really i really maybe if you cut that one no no that's right we'll keep it in <laughs> but um for me like if it wasn't for games i wouldn't be in cybersecurity. to be honest um like i i read i watched this on the video that you did uh with it was 100 proof the bug bounty yeah guy. um he said like just being around games in general as a kid um, allowed me to be around for computers more, around IT more, and I was became the person in the family that like could configure or fix any like IT problem that we had. Um, but you know, when I first got into RuneScape, like, um, well, actually, you know, what kind of maybe we can talk about crypto if you want about how I RuneScape got me into crypto. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, That'll sure. be an interesting story. Yeah. So, like, when I was. Um, in 2012, this was RuneScape 3 before Old School RuneScape came out. Um, there was a lot of gambling in the game. I was a dice host. like So two players would trade you. They'd give you like 5 million coins each. Um, you'd hold the money safely. And then whoever rolled the highest number would get 90% of the winnings. So they'd get 9 million coins. And you'd keep 1 million. So you get 10% because you're a trusted person. that like you know, You're like kind of like escrow for all these people that are gambling, essentially. And so... That happened for a couple of years and I was making all this gold and I was just um, selling it to people online. Now, whether that's like to virtual gold sites or like on like IRC chat, you know what I mean? Like selling people, sell, selling people gold for like PayPal and stuff. But, you know, I was underage and you're not allowed to have a PayPal account. So I'd have my accounts get closed by PayPal all the time. I'd make new ones get closed. Um, people would charge back all the time. So you get your accounts closed for chargebacks. A chargeback is basically when someone makes a payment with PayPal and then they call PayPal and they say, I didn't authorize that payment. Then PayPal reverses the payment because it's a virtual transaction. Like there's no receipt for like tr- uh, shipping or anything like that that you can provide them. So the funds are reversed and sent back to the person that sent them. But then you've given them your gold in the game, so they they like get it for free. So I had this problem where I was like, 
I need to like receive payment for all this gold that I'm making. I don't know what to do. And that's when I went on a forum uh, called Scythe and I found out about Bitcoin. And I thought, this is really cool. Um, and this was, I didn't actually get into it straight away. That was in uh, December, 2013. And gold was about 800 USD a coin. It was the first time that, I oh know, so Bitcoin was 800 USD a coin. And that was the first time it kind of like mooned. It went from like 100 US dollars to like 800 in maybe like three to six months. Um, and I hadn't got into it just then. I was still like looking at it, but I saw it crash in like January 2014 from 800 to 300. That was like a really big drop. And that was because of the Mt. Gox um, exchange hack. And I saw that hack and I was like, that's so cool. Like that's a, a real life attack that's happened. Um, and someone's, you know, made all this money off Bitcoin. And that c kind of got the things going like inside of my head, like understanding about how attacks work and that, you know, this is essentially like a treasure chest at the end of the rainbow kind of thing, you know, for all these attackers. But that's when I first got into gold and I saw I started selling, um, well, it's first when I first got into Bitcoin. So I started selling my RuneScope gold for Bitcoin um, to Chinese gold farmers who would then sell it for a higher price to players that would pay in like credit card and stuff. So you might sell it to them for a dollar per mil and they sell it for two dollars per mil or something like that. But they would sell it in smaller quantities and you sell it in very large quantities, like, you know, a thousand dollars at once, things like that. But because I was under rage, I didn't know what to do with all this Bitcoin. I couldn't sell it. There was not really any exchanges back then, so I just let it accumulate. Um, and from that time period of 2013 to 2017, uh, Bitcoin stayed relatively around 300, well, 250 to 300 US dollars for quite a long time. So the price didn't change much at all. But eventually, um, I did sell all of my Bitcoin. Um, I sold 79 Bitcoin for $30,000. Damn, that's uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was 16. Oh, no, I was maybe 18, 17 at the time or something like that. So $30,000 as a 17-year-old. I was like, I'm fucking rich. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I bought a car, which has now been written off. Um, I bought a computer, which doesn't work anymore. And I had $10,000 left over after that. Um, so I quit my job, a, a casual job, and paid myself 100 bucks a week for two years. But, you know, that 79 Bitcoins at its peak was like $7 million. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And my car, the car that I had is now, like, written off. So I basically have nothing to show for it, you know what I mean? So, I mean, what could I have done? Could I have gone back and kept it all? No, I don't know. But who knows? I don't really try to think much about it. But I remember when it, like, when the price peaked in, I think, 2018 or something like that at, a th at like, $1,000, I was like, holy shit. But then when it peaked at 20K and then at, like, 85K Australian, like, in the last year... That was when I was like, oh my God, <laughs> like, <laughs> like it started to get really bad. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Definitely a lot of like, you know, second guessing myself and stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I probably, if, it's, if it moved up 10%, I would have sold it. You know what I mean? Like, let alone if it moved up, you know, 50,000 X or whatever. So I can't hurt myself for it. But spinning this story into like back into cybersecurity, um, you know, from, from Bitcoin, on all those forums where I was selling RuneScape gold for Bitcoin is when I started to learn about like the somewhat like black hat community within RuneScape, you could say. Um, I would say it's gray hat maybe because it's not technically illegal. Oh, actually some of the things people were doing were illegal. So technically it was black hat, but I was just like watching what people would do because, you know, I was selling a lot of RuneScape gold. I was in this IRC chat and people were also selling a lot of gold to this one vendor and I wanted to figure out, well, what are they doing to make the gold? And that's when I figured out that you know, people were doing things like um, DDoS attacks, for like ransomwares, like they'd go into a duel and DDoS the other player and then beat them and take their stuff. Or they might um, like rat people, get them to download a file of a Skype and then like, you know, use a remote access Trojan to get into their computer and take their, their, their RuneScape gold and all sort of stuff. And it was getting crazy. Like I found it very fascinating how these somewhat like script kitty type people were essentially using, you know, extremely illegal software to perform you know, nefarious actions, but within a game like RuneScape, you know what I mean? Um, so that was really fascinating, but um, yeah, I tried to steer clear from that sort of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I, I played the game earlier than you actually. Uh, I started earlier than you. Earlier? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, hang on, when did you start playing? I, I was playing in RuneScape Classic. I played oh RuneScape Classic for like six months or so, and then <laughs> um, RuneScape uh, 2, I guess. Oh my that God, time. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. and. Like when you're talking about like these, like getting people to download rats and stuff. Like, I remember just 
getting scammed of mm. like my first Rune 2H, like yeah. a RuneScape <laughs> classic. And I was like falling for like trust, yeah. trust, trust, like, trust test kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, like just things like that definitely <laughs> made you more aware of like scams and um, just being more aware of like cyber concepts, I guess, um, even before, you know, I realized what that was, you know, really was. Uh, yeah. yeah, so <laughs> I, I think, would you say playing the game has been a net positive or a net negative in your life? I'd say net positive. I mean, there was definitely times in high school where like I played way too much and I really should have gone outside, you know, but now for me, it's like a good balance of, it's my stress release. Like I don't really watch TV or anything like that. Um, if I want to have a few hours off on a Friday night, then I'll play a bit of RuneScape, you know what I mean? But mm. net positive for sure. Um, but yeah, it, it's interesting. Like, you know, you do learn about trust and things like that with strangers because you're playing a game with people you don't know. And there's a lot of quite um, complex scams that do exist, like anti-scam scams and things like that, where people are on a phone call with you on Discord and you think that they're on your side and they're helping you beat a scammer, but really they're the one that's scamming you and trying to trick you into going to a dangerous place and things like that. Because in these games, there's items in the games which are worth thousands of dollars. Like party hats and RuneScape 3 are worth like five to 10,000 US dollars, you know what I mean? And there's items in Alter RuneScape which are worth like 2,000 US dollars, you know what I mean? So for some people, that's like, you know, a month's paycheck or more, you know? So why there's a lot of people that have invested a lot of time in figuring out how to, you know, take advantage of people in that game. Mm. So it can teach you a lot, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know, for me, I've sunk so many hours into that game, too yeah. many. I can't say whether it's been a net positive, net negative. Yeah. Um, definitely did learn some stuff, but man, the hours sank into yeah. that game. <laughs> it's a grind game. Like it's definitely a game that you you can't essentially beat it. Like there's no finish, there's no end. It's just forever, basically. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Jacob. Yeah, no uh, thanks for coming in um, to have a chat. I'm sharing your experiences. I'm sure it'll help um, a lot of people uh, trying to get into this industry. Appreciate no it, man. All good. See you later. Sweet. Cheers.